Joining me now is John D. How are you doing? I'm doing reasonably well. Reasonably well. Okay. I mean, as well as well as could be in in these dark times. Well, uh, you're about very happy to face to the be here with you. And so, you're gonna uh... you're gonna make me not reasonably well, are you? <laughs> well, pe people suffer all kinds of injuries on their way through the the perilous. The, you know, the, mm. the next six. Uh, six uh, rounds of intense questioning are going to leave you like a quivering wreck. Or, or more of a quivering wreck than I already am. <laughs> so, first round, would you like the topic of music, economics, or cosmology? <laughs> well, I certainly don't want to talk about economics because, you know... <laughs> uh, the dismal I, science. I, 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 exactly. I haven't. I haven't. I haven't brushed up on my. Uh, who are those people that I used to like? Mises. Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, cosmology. Okay. That's that's tricky because that could be that could be like you know actual cosmology or it could be something. Well, else. the the questions I'll say are pretty uh, broad and open ended, so I'm not going to be asking you like for an equation. <laughs> this mm. is. This is more discursive. Okay, and, and, <laughs> and I think cosmology nobody has nobody has picked so far. So I don't have to talk about Lagrange points or you know no the, unless you the, unless you want to Chandra Sikhar's limit. Uh, <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, I uh, hmm. Music, music be the food of love. Oh dear. Well, I feel like pe people have chosen music. I will. I will take a chance and choose cosmology. Let uh, favor. What, what is it? Luck favor the bold. There's an expression. Yeah, like fortune favor the bold. Yeah. Fortune. Uh, the universe began with a big bang. The universe undergoes cyclical periods of expansion and contraction, or the fine tuning of the universe is purely coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> you can really, I, yes, you really put choose... yourself in a sticky spot here. So. I choose again. Okay, let's see. You can if you want. No, no, no. I'll figure out how to roll it back. The universe undergoes cyclical periods of expansion and contraction. By the way, you can either argue in favour or against, or simply discuss one of these statements. Mm. You know, the fine tuning of the universe is purely coincidental. Well, ooh, but I will be giving you a score at the end of the round. Oh no, this is this is this is awful. Um, this is socially uh, 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 awful, but quite entertaining. Okay, I am going to. Uh, oh dear, oh dear. Uh, okay, I am going to choose n n number one. Uh, the universe the began with a big bang. There you yeah. Go. Uh, take it away. Are you? Do you want to argue for or against this? Uh, or or just merely discuss? Well, let's 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 discuss. Um, but also, I'm I'm also going to probably put myself on the this is true in the, this is true cat camp. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah. Um, hmm. Why, why don't you why don't you provide some sort of framing for me? Okay. Well, or, uh, yeah. as I understand it, there was a solid state model of the universe that scientists believed in. And then it was actually a group of Christians who made arguments that because they can see uh, the see the stars uh, receding into the distance, I think through redshift and such, mm. that if you extrapolate back in time, everything must have been in one place. And this was actually seen at the time as a piece of evidence for the validity of the Bible. Because the the Bible says that uh, God created the universe at, at some point in in the finite history, so the, much the opposite of how it's often seen. The Big Bang yeah. is uh, it w was originally an anti atheist concept. Yes, in fact, backing. if I recall, it was it was it was one of the the people who expanded upon it. In, in the early days, and by the early days, I believe it was the early twentieth century, was a was a Catholic priest. Uh, I can't remember right. his name, but but uh, I I do believe that the first person to kind of expand this um, idea 
was 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 a literal Roman Catholic priest. Um, so yes, and and of course, I, as with so many so many sort of topics of you know having to do with, I mean, the word science is so muddled now mm. because of course, like everything else, it it is it is used. It has it has a sort of political connotation or metapolitical frame, uh, as we as we all know. I mean, you know, it's 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 part of you know it's part of the nature of, of a kind of managerial regime to to need so called experts and what bigger yeah. expert than the scientists? Because of course, the twentieth century, mm. certainly the nineteenth twentieth century, you know, the the, the idea of of the kind of professional scientist you know as as sort of um the replacement for the clergyman and the theologian and the priest uh, as a as a person who, who who delivers sort of profound truths you know filtered through through this new idea of rational you know rationality and 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 uh, you know and uh, the, the scientific method uh you know it's very difficult to kind of te you know to tease apart these things and so you're you're right i mean the tendency is is to is is to regard any uh sort of you know scientific claim or theory a as a sort of automatically as a mark as a, as as an argument against traditional understandings of the cosmos mm. and god and, and in know, contrast and, and, to faith yes yes you know, it's it's always going to be a disproof of faith, which of course it isn't, and it wasn't. I mean, in the you know, in the in the sort of sort of early days of or sort of the beginnings of what what we we call science, you know, I mean, they they didn't you know they they tended to refer to themselves as as natural philosophers rather than hmm. scientists. I don't think that other sort of uses of scientists came about until the really probably the nineteenth century, but. Uh, I mean, as as a kind of term of art, but uh, and many of the early scientists were certainly devout believers. Some of them were members of religious orders. You know, um, I mean, even in, even in now in the twentieth century, and I looked, and his name is Georges Lemaitre, uh, was hmm. um, was the was the priest and physicist who uh, first proposed um, the, the Big Bang. So, uh, so yes, I, I think that there's this modern idea, you know, Mehekin science. That, that just assumes that it, it's the same mistake I think people make with Charles Darwin and what Charles Darwin proposed, what he wrote, and and the sort of meaning of that because it became that became politicized very early. I mean, there was a very famous uh, trial in America called which is which is referred to as the Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, and people can look that up. But it was basically. Um, a case involving the teaching of na Darwinian natural selection, uh, you know, in 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 a, in a, in, a, in a I believe in a, an American government school, uh, and uh, so 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 yes, I mean you, you know, uh, but but I think it's it's even fraud to just assume that you know that that even even a topic a contentious topic like like you know Darwinian theory of of, of of natural selection and so-called evolution uh is necessarily anti a, 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 you know anti-faith um so mm. yeah uh and so so the same with the big bang i mean there's nothing there's nothing intrinsic to that theory that that has any effect on biblical you know christian narratives of creation you know uh it, it, and and as you say, it was just seen as as more proof because of course it you know it we know that in a large enough scale, time and and distance or space and time are sort of entwined, you know, and and, and of course there's a temporal aspect to the distances we're talking about with you know when you you start to observe the universe. Um, so and 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 yes, I mean that there was nothing particularly. Um, I would ha I. I I I I would say that I I'm not uh, I I don't have much memory of uh, Lemaitre's uh, specific propositions and how he framed this uh, subject, but uh, I would have to go back and read it. But but yeah, I mean, I, I, I as you say, it it could be used as a as a proof of the kind of you know aspects of uh, of God's creation, um, not necessarily as 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 modern people tend to do, is assume that all scientific truth or all scientific conjecture 
is by nature anti-faith and anti-God. There's an um, aspect to the logic that has always been a little perplexing to me. Um, mm -hmm. That is, we, so, okay, we, we observe that nearby galaxies seem to be receding, and then Hubble allows us to calculate the even very distant galaxies are moving away, and then you... Yeah. You extrapolate from that, that that therefore the entire universe is all moving outwards. But of course, we we only know about the observable universe, and we've got no idea whatsoever how much universe there is beyond what we can observe. So, in in order to say that the the entirety of space and time must have been expanding throughout all of history, you are ignoring the possibility of there being just a local expansion. I mean, it's funny saying local, meaning the entire observable mm. universe. Yeah. But, you, you know, in, in theoretical terms, you could imagine that, you know, the, the space, the volume of space for which light can reach us is much smaller than the size of uh structures you know we we observe some pretty enormous structures in in the observable universe but uh if we are simply part of a region of all of reality which is growing but there are other regions that are shrinking and you know i think this this principle that everything is identical and all the all the uh, like the strength of g and uh etc are the same wherever you go is the cosmological principle. And as far as I can tell, largely unsupported, um, I guess the the only real evidence would be the cosmic microwave background radiation being incredibly similar in all directions. So there's kind of a... Everything that we can see s looks flat in a certain sense. But yeah. it's a big extrapolation to say, and therefore... Yeah. Everywhere, everything we know about. Yeah, and it's also I, I think it's, it's it's also important to point out that the the, the this mod this particular model was never meant to explain the origin of existence, the origin of the universe, mm. which it, it doesn't at all. It merely describes that there was once a, a, a very high density very high temperature collection of uh of of matter you know and and mm. energy you know and and that at some point this expanded outwards in you know in a in a great rush and that this this acceleration is observable and it continues it does not explain nor has it ever tried to explain the origin of uh, the origin of the universe you know because because right. of course the universe existed before the big bang it just existed in a different state you know um mm -hmm. as a, and and of course these these ideas of a singularity and and one you know again one can easily sort of sort of say that you know again from a theological perspective that that this singularity this point of of great energy and great great density of, of being is the godhead you know, is is you know, it is it it, it is the nature of God, and that that you know, there is no sufficient model, ex, exper, experimental or observable model that could explain, of course, the origin of 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 this of this singularity, and it, only that at a certain point. I mean, and again, you could you can follow the narrative in Genesis and and, and apply it to this, you know, a single point uh, that that it, at a certain point, you know. Let there be light, and and it's sort of, and of course that is one of the things that happened in the theory in the Big Bang theory is that is that it was this 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 massive expansion of of light and matter uh, outwards from a single point. So so I, I think you you know again uh, I think people get get it wrong in, in the idea that there was nothing before the Big Bang. That's just simply not true by by the nature of theory. And the, the, right. and I, well, I will say I will I will concede that that there are a lot of there are problems with the theory. Now you mentioned dark, dark matter and such. That is not explained at all. 
by yeah. by the traditional and there's this Big Bang funny theory. fudge of um, rapid expansion, unexplained short period of massively faster expansion, which, as I understand yeah. it, is sort of to do with the what I mentioned about the CMB that under the normal principles of physics you'd expect that space would be a lot patchier and this, this is unexplained so you just put a fudge as with so many scientific theories until you've got an actual explanation you just put in a, a fudge factor you just put a number in <laughs> that yeah. will kind of fit and then at a later point when you have more understanding and a more sophisticated idea of what actually happened you fix that but uh, there's quite a few of those within the um, current understanding of the early universe. It's like, what happens before this time? No idea. What happens <laughs> to cause this at this time period? Don't know. Absolutely no idea. <laughs> Don't know. And, and, and of course, why, you know, the, 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 the sort of chronology, the temporal aspect of this, the, the, there are issues with that. Now, of course, I'm wading into uh, physics, which... Uh, you know, most of which I've forgotten, and which most of which are entirely beyond my ability to uh, to uh, to, ex to explain them, let alone get my, my head around them. But uh, um, I know that, of course, there there is this con concept of Planck time, which is mm. ten to the minus forty three seconds, which has something to do with that departure from singularity. And I believe mm. that there are also problems with this. I mean, the, 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 that, that why in this extreme, extremely distant point in, 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 in time, why the universe hasn't basically even died and, and died, you know, <laughs> why, mm. why, why is, why is this still going on given, given that? Now, I don't, again, I don't know exactly the relationship there, but I certainly remember, um, I certainly remember reading reading about that. So, uh, and of course, then it, and, and then of course, what is the ultimate? Um, what is the ultimate fate of all of this? And how does that fit into this model? You know, that of course, mm. there's there's the there's this idea of of ultimate entropy that there will it, at some point in the very distant future there will there will everything will be so spread out that that there will be basically no there will be no energy of sort of called the heat death of the universe. There just won't be enough mm -hmm. energy to cause any kind of interaction. And at that point you've reached maximum entropy and, and, and it's all gone, you know? Um, and then what happens, you know? Uh, mm. Now there's a, um, there's a wonderful story um, called, and of course, again, because I am, I am very old. Uh, I have to look up the uh, look up the date of this uh, story. It's it's by um, Asimov, and it's called "The Last Question," uh, and it was mm. 1956. Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever read this, Luke. I I know about it. I I've not actually read it. I it's very interesting because it's it sort of it sort of combines uh, a theological with a kind of a kind of scientific slash futurist explanation of of this of 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 the beginning and and the end uh and of course it um you know it 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 it, it ends with a point where all of uh i mean all all of all of humanity sort of quote evolves and evolves in it finally into an incorporeal uh in, in, in corporeal, from a from a sort of computer mediated kind of neural network into this just incorporeal universe wide consciousness, and but you know that 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 at a certain point again through this great maximum entropy and and this this sort of heat death, it, everything sort of ceases, you know, and and then the not to not to spoil the ending, but let let's just say that you know an infinite amount of time passes and then this consciousness which was once individual humanity and it evolved into this just sort of completely dissipated universe brain you know sits and, and then says of course let there be light and it all happens mm. again 
So it, that, of course, ties into this idea that, that this process, unexplained as it is, it, it, it will be a cyclical process uh, on, a, on a grand scale. Uh, who, who knows? But if people have not read this story, it's, it's wonderful. So. Yes, presumably that is what Douglas Adams was parodying in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. They build, build the machine to find the answer to the ultimate question that ends up being <laughs> yes, 42. It's... It's 42, yeah. And then they don't know what the question was, so then they have to build a machine that uh, finds the <laughs> ultimate question. And that that machine, oh. I think, turned out to be Earth. Like, Earth was actually created manually to be a yeah, part of the computation. Yeah, it was a bio-computer, yeah. yeah. And they were very um, cross with the Vogons for... The, the the mice who were actually running the show were very upset. <laughs> oh, oh, right. The, yes, I can't remember. What demolished the yeah. all, uh, horrible little mouse. Ma yeah. Yes. Um, speaking of, I, I'm my, my house is currently being invaded by a by a very large mouse, and this oh, mouse has managed to steal the bait off of traps four times. <gasps> it's a very clever <laughs> mouse. It may be. It may be one of these these. These genius mice from Hitchhikers. Who yes. <laughs> well, look, I'm, I'm going to give you a score of eight. So you're off to an excellent start in this game, and we'll we'll have a look at the next round. All right. Uh, what do you fancy? Ethics, history, or metaphysics? Let me put on my on my reading glasses. Okay, let's see. Ethics, history, metaphysics. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Uh, <laughs> I am going to choose. Uh, hmm. I'm going to choose metaphysics. Continuing with the, uh, I think some of the most exciting uh, theme. You, you, your, uh, your, your choosing topics that uh, excite me. So yeah, doing a good job. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Objects are merely a language game, or reality is purely physical. Ooh. And and remember, you can argue against yeah. these if you prefer. Okay. Um. Here we, here we, yeah. uh, Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Objects are merely a language game, or reality is purely physical. Well, Luke, I think I'll choose door number one. <laughs> Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, great. Uh, we can talk about aesthetics. Yes. Uh, and are you, you arguing for or against? I'm arguing against. I, I, I'm arguing. I, I would say that I'm arguing against with, 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 with caviar. Because, I, because of course, I, I believe that there is i mean it's, again you you've got to think about what why, what do you, what do you mean by beauty you know and i think people talk about this people talk about beauty they want they want to see beauty in the world they want to see beautiful people they you know people talk about you know there's there's all kinds of trad accounts who who, who you know who lament the go loss into of beauty in the world yeah they go into fits about art modern architecture or modern art or you know modern you, you know breakfast cereals i don't know and everything of course is, is a sort of lament for the fact that, that beauty has gone out of this or that and beauty has gone out of the world uh, but the question of course is what 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 do people mean when they say beauty and and i will of course offer the the proviso that that being a an art, professional artist and an artist all my life and a, and, a, and quite, quite a sort of a person very much attuned to questions of, of of beauty and harmony and mm. and art and all of these things i don't know that i could sort of perfectly describe it because i think there is an aspect to ideas of of beauty that is that is beyond rational mm. uh that is beyond sort of rational explanation or beyond sort of some uh beyond a sort of summarization I think there is a sort of uh, there's a sort of um, uh, there's a higher plane, which to which we have some very limited access, and some of us, of course, 
can learn or some of us are are gifted more more access to this plane but i don't think any of us in our in our human corporeal state can really understand this i mean it's a very similar sort of idea to you you know to 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 of course closeness uh closeness to god you know that that of course Mm. you 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 can you can you can draw yourself nearer to god or god will draw nearer to you as a reciprocal relationship but of course you can never you can never fully comprehend because there's a there's an at the at the center of it is a mystery is a divine mystery and i think i think that beauty is very much the same thing but of course naturally it would be because i think that that there's an aspect of what we call beauty or in fact the, the totality of what we call beauty is also related to the divine related to this idea of the perfection uh uh of of of, of, of a sort of spiritual realm and I, as i said i think that some of us you know the people we think of as as as, as great artists great aestheticians great architects whatever you know poets musicians i think that those those fortunate people have been tuned slightly closer that that have mm. a, ha, have slight a slightly better access uh to to this this divine music um but i don't think it's completely knowable so so this is the problem when you you know, talk <clears throat> about beauty what what you actually mean i think a lot of people tend to you know that idea of beauty that they 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 have at least partially is is a sort of you know quite easily explain mundane thing that people like symmetry you know that the people like that there's certain kinds of you know harmonies of color there's certain kinds of you know relationships of shapes and 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 things that that you know that people just tend to like that tend to please the human eye for one reason or the other um yeah. but but i do think that there is some aspect of beauty that is beyond that is that is beyond the observer i think that there is fundamental beauty that would exist whether we were there to perceive it or not so this is why i'm saying that i don't i don't quite buy it because it because again this well it's and you, you can slip back into physics and say well you know is the observer necessary uh and and certainly in the case of, of beauty i think beauty exists it existed for us and Will exist after us so you know but mm. but our perception of it is also very important and i think al- also our perception our ability to perceive it and to create it and uh, you know and 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 to love beauty is a divine gift you know so, mm. so that's why i say i'm i'm a little little bit of both but yeah i think that's very very well said and I also grapple with these ideas myself that there is there, there is a concept of beauty, and then there is a concept of goodness, and those things are not the same, but there is a link. And mm. then there's, as you say, there's things that we find beautiful, like symmetry, but then also like um, the face of somebody that we love. Um, and I think those are not the definition or the the source of beauty. They're sort of within. They are things that we find beauty within, but the beauty is, to me, is a a greater thing. It's it it's very reductive. It feels reductive, and incorrect to me when you analyze beauty and say. It, it's some mathematical relation or it's some biological link to pleasure or so you know there's something completely pure about the concept of beauty that that is again divinity is maybe another concept somehow when we experience art or even just life experiences that we recognize beauty and at the same time we recognize divinity not not saying that those are the same thing, but they these are realms almost beyond our ability to to grasp or talk about that we we just tap into briefly in these little ways. Yes, but you know, and of course there 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 are also problems you know, with this because of course beauty can be used to deceive. 
you know, and 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 that's a theme mm. that you find in 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 great lit, lit, literature from you know from mm. ages past, and it's something you also find in you know certainly in uh, in Christianity and elsewhere. That that of course yeah. our our sort of admiration of beauty can can also be our you know our our downfall. You know, uh, mm. and and again, class whether it's classical history or you know. Uh, Christian theology or, or, or whatever, you know, I mean, you can, you can be like Narcissus, yeah. you know, who's become in, in, so in, enraptured with, with your self beauty that of course, you know, that the horrible consequences happen to you, you know, mm. that you can be so seduced by, you know, um, and of course, in many accounts, you know, even, you know, even, even Lucifer uh, can appear to people. As, as as a as as a, as a beautiful figure, and so of course there is mm. there is questions: is, be, is beauty? I mean, is is uh, you know is beauty is truth truth beauty? But is is that true? Can beauty also lie? And I think the modern world is 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 another great example is of 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 the of the the dark seductive nature of our admiration for for things things beautiful. Um, so, uh, so it it is not, and, and and of course, this is I think, I think, in it, this helps argue in favor of what you you said is that you know these things can't be quantified; they can't be sort of explained away by you know. I mean, you you, for instance, there's a British artist of the 18th century who I quite admire called William Hogarth. You know, you probably know him; he's very well known. Um, mm. But he actually had a whole theory called the line of beauty, where there was this very specific kind of S curve shape that he thought was was you know was was something that occurred in in nature, that occurred in the human female body, that occurred in in various contexts that 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 could be sort of almost rationally codified as you know well this is a a constant you know and it. And of course, it doesn't work. It it does not work that way. It's not that simple, no. you know. Like any other the, question, like like questions of of you know, like questions of good good and evil. They're then they're not always so easy. There's, there's something about the the human form that feels like at once deeply beautiful and also then strangely arbitrary you know that you can kind of convince yourself that i'm um, like this hogarth idea i guess that as what it is that we find beautiful is some mathematical relation but when when it's you know the human form you you kind of are detecting bone and muscle and sinew and skin <laughs> stacked up on top of each other and and the, you recognize the subsurface scattering of the the light hitting the skin and something about the the pose and it's there's so much deeply human and grounded and not at all mathematical about that and and yet you know if if you were to compare a rendering of a perfect sphere you know, under perfect lighting conditions, versus a photograph of a of a beautiful person, you can't argue that the sphere is less symmetric, and yet there is a real sense in which the photo of the person is more beautiful. Um, so I, I I guess it's just again trying to grapple with the concept, and it's easier to knock down trite statements about beauty than it is to construct some actual understanding of it well it's it's wonderfully ir irrational you know i mean there, yeah. there is as with so many things i i i absolutely love things that confound this yeah. this lie of, 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 of it feels like looking into one of those um what, what is it called you put it up to your eye and it's got loads of mirrors and glass in it and colors oh, a you turn kaleidoscope it a kaleidoscope Feel like grappling with the concept of beauty is kaleidoscopic. Mm. You think you've just got your hands on it, and then it turns slightly, and suddenly the the whole shape of the idea of beauty is is different. In, in, indeed, we... and of course, it's it's also tied it's also tied up with so many so many other things. And certainly, you can't talk about the human mm. form 
I mean, you know, there's an, there's certainly an admiration of beauty there, but there are also other considerations, some more animal than others, you know, that, right. that influence How... what we find beautiful in the human form. Um, yeah. How do how do we how does beauty interface with sexuality? Yeah. Um, there's a there's a kind of bestial mindset that seems to preclude beauty, and yet at the same time there's a way in which sexuality can be perfectly aligned with beauty. And it yeah. seems to be quite contextual in a way. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I, I very sad to have to end this conversation. Uh, even oh. more sad to have to score it, which seems particularly, uh, particularly <laughs> heinous. Like, <laughs> to, to take us from the su sublime to the absurd. But I'm going to give you 12. Oh. <laughs> I have no is, idea what that uh, means, but I'll, I'll take no, it. No, and great the, nor, sh nor should you. Uh, <laughs> but it's a high score. Take it that way. Um, in fact, it's the highest score. Well, the highest score I've ever given out. Not, I'm not limiting myself. Um, cinema and theatre, world affairs, or epistemology. What do you fancy? Okay, hang on. Uh, glasses on. Cinema and theatre. I, I, mean, I know you've read them, but I need to look at them. I need to see them myself. Cinema sure. and theater, world affairs, or epistemology. I'm going to go this time with the materialist choice is cinema and theater. All right. Would you like to talk about we have lost the communal experience of storytelling, music is the most important element of a film, or each generation gets the culture they deserve? Well, I'm immediately drawn to the to the middle question. Music is the most important element of the film. Great. And I will That's state true. categorically that that is that is false from from the from the from the fundamental understanding of cinema uh, and 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 all that should be good and true if the world were perfect. <laughs> I, that is categorically false. Unfortunately, though. Like beauty, that can also it can also uh, corruption. Corruption has entered the the, the mm. system. Anyway, that, yeah, that. Mm. There we go. Uh, well, well, would you like to make your case for why music is not the most important element of a film? Well, I mean, cinema. I mean, the, the very the, the very sort of heart of, of cinema is the image, the moving image i mean otherwise it, you know i mean it, it, it of course it it's the cinema. most yeah. yeah i mean it, it, the 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 very i mean nature of the medium and, and i'm going Definitely. to sort of... if there's if it's a silent film it's still a film if there's no image it's not a film it's not a film exactly i mean if and if if, if it, yeah exactly if there's a film with no music it's still cinema it's still a film you know no it mm. it, 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 it you know it, it, it is specifically not just as you know it's not like it like theater where you know yes obviously there's image but it's not the same sort of image it's specifically the capturing through photography of you know light and dark onto a well traditionally onto a piece of emulsion you know onto an onto an emulsion covered piece of uh, plastic or uh, or uh, celluloid as it used to be uh you know that that is then you know light passes through it and is projected upon a screen that it is image now i will also say that the broader art of cinema is enhanced uh, or or certainly at its best it can be enhanced by music and of course we enter into the territory of the uh, of the total work of like richard wagner this idea that of course you know um what what I can't remember what the I, I'm not going to try German pronunciation. It's always a disaster. But but anyway, Wagner had this idea, of, you know, and and exemplified in in the Ring Cycle, you know, his his Ring, Ring of the Nibelungen, that that this there was a sort of total art of 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 opera where where sound and light and costume and speech and plot and staging. I mean, all of these things combine to create a kind of super 
artwork an artwork that surpassed everything else because of course it, it was it was totalizing and i do think that cinema uh was the inheritor and of course cinema also also had its had, had its nascent moment at nearly near around the same time and certainly slightly after after Wagner's peak. Uh, so I do think that there is something about cinema that of course that, that of course inherited this idea. And 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 music, of course, as soon as it was viable, and actually prior to it being viable uh, to, to actually have recorded music synchronized with film, because even in the silent film era, they were almost never projected silently. There was there was there was either there was live music that was played along, there was often the person Playing a playing a console organ, or there were there, sometimes a you know a, a chamber ensemble or someone at piano, depending upon you know the, the facility where you were watching this film. There was always sound at there was always sound with it anyway, and and often music. It was usually in the form of music, and then and then when they could have recorded music, non synchronous synchronized recorded music, they would do that, and of course then the great advent of synchronous sound. And immediately, of course, the 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 art of silent film died. You know, I mean, it was very clear mm. that the advent of that technology, it, it just it suited everyone to the point where there was just no reason. There was no reason to, you know. Now, of course, I'm not saying that there have been silent films made after the period, but um, for the most part, that mm. that form of cinema died so i'm not saying that music is not very important to cinema i think it always has been even in the so-called silent era but i don't i think that you can have cinema with with absolutely no no, no music at all um and uh, i i have some examples of this if we could Ooh. talk about them um yes please for instance i i will take a i will take a i will take a strange one which is there's a film from 1963, I believe, by Alfred Hitchcock, called *The Birds*. Uh -huh. And you, I, 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 have you seen this film? I'm afraid I've not seen. I, I, I know of it. It's very, very highly thought of um, it, yeah. horror film. Is it? Uh, yes. It's a, it's a suspense slash horror. Yeah. It's a very strange film. I mean, it's based upon a, a story by an author called Daphne du Maurier, mm. and. It, 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 so, in, in the, the the essence of the story is that uh, there's a, a beautiful woman, as there always is in, in Hitchcock, at the center of all Hitchcock films, uh, or most of them. Um, there's a beautiful woman who uh, goes to a beach house, or sort of a. She goes into the. I mean, she's in San Francisco at the beginning, and then she travels to the countryside, uh, and or, or to, a, to a small co to a small you know uh, seaside town some some somewhat away from San Francisco and for no reason at all there's no explanation ever given in this film all the birds start going mental like every bird in the in the world starts going mental <laughs> to the point where it's basically an apocalyptic situation uh, and it is never explained at all uh which is which is one of the things that's so wonderful about it. Yeah. It, it absolutely it confounds every sort of tendency of modern commercial cinema uh because it does not hold your yeah. hand but the other explained nothing is explained at all it, and, and which is again also one of the reasons why it is so uncanny and they're so unnerving right. that film. but yeah. one of the other reasons that film is so unnerving is that there is no music in the film there there are a couple mm. of moments of what's called diegetic music where like she will i she'll go into a cafe and there may be you know, music to hear for a moment whatever that is being played in the cafe non-diegetic music is when there's like a you know howard shaw like emotional yeah. score playing on top of you know frodo and you know sam the, doing the, something the characters different. in the movie cannot hear the music yes they cannot hear the music diegetic sound that they can hear but there is very little little music at all and there is no score the only so but there is there is a soundtrack and the soundtrack of course is the noise of the birds and mm. in the case of this film much of that 
soundtrack, much of the much of the incidental sounds of these birds were produced with early analog synthesizers. Um, so mm. they're not there are naturalistic bird sounds, but there's also these very weirdly distorted noises that were kind of produced that you hear a lot and, and sort of hear increasingly as the film goes on. Uh, but no, there is no soundtrack. That is, that is a, it's a very rare, rare example of a kind of mm. modern commercial film that has absolutely no music in it whatsoever. And, and it contributes mm. greatly to the, to the, to the sense of psychological unease. Well, I was going to say that the absence of music in a film probably has an unsettling effect. Yes. Um, and I've, I've also sometimes thought this when you join a, so sometimes what happens at work is that I'm I'm working remotely, for example, I'm you know I'm at home, but I'm joining a meeting where a bunch of people are in a room together. So you have a camera and an audio feed of a room, and then you are sitting watching, largely silently watching this play out for an hour, and it is there's also something very uncomfortable and slightly unsettling about that experience. It's like you're being yeah. forced to observe a Hitchcockian drama yeah. that, that uh, is is live and unscripted. But um, the choice not to have music is is as much of a... Well, well it wasn't it Hitchcock who talked about how uh, context is everything in cinema. So if you see a man staring and then it cuts to and he's you know he's smiling cuts to a baby you think that the man is a fatherly figure but if you see the same shot of the man staring and then it cuts to a a woman who's you know maybe changing unobserved she doesn't doesn't know that she's being watched you then interpret the exact same footage of the man as a, a creepy stare oh, yep. and and in the I same way the music or the lack of music is is participating in combination with whatever's on the screen to create a particular atmosphere. Absolutely, and there there is a lot of writing on 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 cinema that talks about this, and and of course one of the absolutely brilliant uh, p artistic potential in cinema is this idea of the montage. The idea of of how editing, like what you can do by mm. placing images uh, in contrast or in harmony with each other in time, mm. temporally, you know, mm. and and cinema. I mean, it's incredible. And 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 you, it was it was possible to do this in theater to a degree, but not to the degree of control that it could be done in cinema. Mm. And of course, that's why the cinema cinema was. I mean, legitimately, you know. Uh, is 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 a new art. I mean, it was a new art, uh, uh, and why it was it was just so captivating, captivating for everybody because it gave them this this sort of power that you said, as you said, you can create narratives just by the juxtaposition or the the, the sort of harmonization of of as you say, you, like an image. You, least you can one image or the other. Have you can have a character be either bigger or smaller, higher in the frame, lower in the frame. Without the character moving, just by moving the camera, you can create all of this visual symbolism in a way that is in independent of the. So, if in a theater, you could, I guess, you could have somebody standing up and somebody sitting down, but that that has to be a. It's constrained by the position of the people in the stage and and the speed that they can move. There's just so many. Yep. exciting artistic possibilities. I mean, I still feel like theatre is... It, maybe this is a silly thing to say. It feel, still feels like it's in its nascent phase. It's like there's so many possibilities that we've... Maybe theatre... Maybe uh, cinema has fallen into certain tropes, but I, I'd be very surprised if there's not a lot more depth and investigation that could happen. There, there but certainly now, is, the, re but the reason I, I should well, say well, the reason that I originally made this assertion was because I was reflecting on the fact that of 
the films that have really stayed with me, it is probably the score more than any other element that has pushed it up to being a, a, a transcendent experience. It's, mm. if, but, if the but score wasn't as good, then the film wouldn't be as good. No, but and this that's is also probably not the case with other elements. I, I suspect that the acting could be worse, the writing of the screenplay could be worse, the visuals could be worse, and I'd probably still love the movie just on the basis of this. But maybe that just reflects my love of of music as a as an art form that that grabs me personally. Well, this is fraught with danger though, because. It it is also like like so many things, like so many powerful sort of tools of an artist, it can be used for good at, for good or ill. It can it can be hmm. used in a lazy way or it can be used in an active way. And unfortunately, many times the the uh, the sort of uh, sort of ineffectiveness of, of 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 the actual cinema of the film of of the moving picture itself can be covered up by putting the putting music over it in other words mm. what the, the 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 dearth of actual mm. cinema talent can can be sort of can be sort of made up for by having having a very manipulative score, and I do think I, I, I there mm. I, I I am often I am often repulsed by music music in films. You know that there, there is there is um be, because of course it can be used to manipulate in, in a way that right. is not is is not earned. You know, in other words, the the director has not been able to tell the story and create. The emotions necessary with the images of itself, and so you mm -hmm. are given very basic musical tropes that tell you how you're meant to feel about this. and And I'm just annoyed by it when it when it is used in in, in a clumsy way. Uh, yeah. And so uh, there I are a lot a, of the, films that I, I think I'd are ruined to, by the score. May, well, maybe so. I, I'd I'd want to draw a distinction between. Poor cinematography being kind of patched up by a score. And then on the other hand, I think you if you're designing your movie with the two working hand in hand, you will shoot differently. So the film might not work without the score by design. That is to say, you might have a silent movie with tension created purely by the visuals if you were to make it into a, a movie with synchronized sound you could shoot it in a much more straightforward way without any hints of tension in the visuals and then add a tense score and it could be more unsettling than if the music and the visuals were Doing the same. This is just an example. I understand. Yeah. In many cases, you want the you want the story being told in multiple ways, but so sometimes you can deliberately contrast the two so that the visuals and the music are doing different things, and the and and it's the it the effect falls in the gap b between the two. Uh, the, there's like two messages coming at you through different sensory inputs. And then your brain is trying to uh, trying to find its way between the two. Well, of course, yeah, yes, of course, a, a, a great artist can use this to advantage. So uh, I, I wanted to bring up another another filmmaker, uh, of course, mm. favorite of mine, Stanley Kubrick, uh, who, who is 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 another another filmmaker who who uses music. It, in a very in a very peculiar way in many of his films and, and many of his films also have no they don't have a traditional score i mean he he was most of his films the music were were pre-existing pieces of music did i, sort of did I hear right that um 
2001, what? he got an entire original score. He, yes. Written. <laughs> Yes, threw it out. He, uh, a, a, a talent, a talented composer called Alex North, wrote an entire score for 2001: A Space Odyssey, and Kubrick used nothing of it. Nothing. And he was paid. Wow. I believe. He, I believe he was paid for it. But no, Kubrick did not use it at all. And I'll tell you, I'm very glad he didn't, because part right. of what is so effective about 2001. I mean, consider, for instance, the first, the first part where you see primeval proto-humans. I believe they're like Australopithecus Africanus. I, I don't know exactly. They're sort of, you know, the, the sort of uh, the sort of primate people at the beginning of 2001. Yeah. When they and so of course there's no music at all in that part because of course there shouldn't be, you know. It's it's very much of course trying to sort of set the scene of the of the sort of prehistorical world. Um and and then, of course, they are visited by a, a, a piece of, of alien geometry, which is which is always what the monolith meant to me. You know, it was it was right angles, which you rarely ever find in nature at all. You certainly never no. find a rectangle that way. And you know, so of course, it's 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 alien geometry that comes. And you know, the 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 proto humans interact with it, and then they become they start to become intelligent you know and so you see their progression from from this sort of communal animal existence to 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 fighting with each other and also to to to, make, to using tools so they begin to hunt by bashing these poor tapers over the head with bones and then there is an one of the greatest cuts in cinema history is that the main proto-human character um, uh, is um, is is shown to have used this bone to kill his enemies and to kill animals for food and to bash things apart and whatever and, and and you get this idea that this was you know this sort of this sort of great leap forward and then he lets out a very sort of primitive you know scream and growl and he throws this bone up into the air and you see it flipping in the cloudless blue sky with no sound at all and then there's a hard cut to a spaceship floating in space uh, no dissolve mm. a hard cut and then for the first time uh since the titles you hear music and of course it's mm. the height of western european sophistication it's a waltz uh and again mm. that is such a brilliant combination of image and sound and music and and silence and mm. all that and and then of course that's I, that's what i mean it can be used it can be used in the right hands the, these things can be used brilliantly now kubrick did i mean he he had a film i i think the closest he came to having a score uh, well, well, Clockwork Orange had a lot of original tracks that were written for the film by a by a man called Walter Carlos, who subsequently became a woman called Wendy Carlos. Um, she also did a whole bunch of. Yes, uh, as, an, uh, as an aside, I I remember being quite surprised that Wendy Carlos. I, I, <laughs> this is a terrible cancelable uh, thing to admit, but I was like, wow. This this um, pioneering composer was a woman. <laughs> and then later, you discover. No, not, oh, not I see. really. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, dear, oh dear, yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, it's odd. And of course, the, the strange thing is, is in in Clockwork Orange, uh, he's credited as Walter Carlos, and then Kubrick's, then and then there was Barry Lyndon, and then there's The Shining, and and. And and Walter Carlos came back and did a, a, a lot of music for The Shining, except of course it was called Wendy Carlos. Then. So it is is a bit confusing. But that's another example. I mean, she she produced a, 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 a quite a number of tracks for the film, which uh, almost none of which he he used except for the main title, mm. uh, which was um, which was which is a very eerie uh, synthesized rendition of Dies Era. You know, mm. um, 
Mm. Another, well, I'll give you a final example, is there's an Italian filmmaker called Michelo Angelo, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni. And he produced another favorite film of mine, which is called Blow Up, which was 1960, I can't remember, 66, 67. Uh, and it's and he, even though he was Italian, this film is set in L swinging London, uh, and it's a very interesting film, uh, and, and I think a very philosophical film. Uh, another, an, and but it's another film that has no non diegetic score. There is music in the film that you hear occasionally, but it's again music that is it is involved in the world of characters in the film. Uh, but otherwise, there are there are great long periods of this film where there is nothing but the sound of birds and you know uh because a, a lot of parts of the film take place in a london park um and it is a, again a very affecting and and also very unnerving there is something unnerving creepy about it partially because of the choice not to use music so even though of course music and and uh, even a, even an original score can be used brilliantly um it can also be used in a lazy way, you know. So again, it's it's uh, it's what you make and what you're able to make of it. Music is like a a signpost. It means that you have more clues about what the scene and the director is trying to get done. That's what, I think that's part of why it's so creepy to have no score, because you really are out in the dark you don't know what's about to happen at any moment anything good and it's it's even more creepy than in real life because in real life you're not going to be teleported to a different location in a split second or you know forced to observe something with zero warning you know there's there's just something uh be, being in the power of a film when somebody else has control of your your entire universe, visual and auditory, is it's a lot of trust to hand over to somebody else. And I, mm. you know, there's something about the the score giving you a kind of a clue about what's going on. What am I trying to? show? It's kind of comforting. I, I think ah. there's almost a safety. To very, the score. very good point. Yeah, very good point. Because I was going to bring up is that I think there is a psychological aspect of the score that that removes you from right it's it's it makes it some film, distance yeah it's there's some distance it's almost it's like, like the fourth you know, wall. yeah you know there's you know that you're not a part of this scene that that there is that there's someone I mean there's the the music is the music is there is proof that that someone is telling you a story that, that it, it's, it's like, a sort it's of, like the frame, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's game, outside the frame. frame. It, exactly, it's outside the frame, and and so it's almost like there's someone with you, you know. It, it's mm. it's it's like watching. I mean, if you've ever seen, watch a situation comedy, and there's a few mm. examples of this where you, you can actually they there are actually the track. copies with no <laughs> there no audience and no laugh track. It is really really weird, and and it does mm. not work. I mean that. You know, yeah. I mean, and of course, I, I think there's something about human psyche. I mean, one of the things yeah. about theater is that theater is not it's 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 a group experience. You know, you're watching something and you're also aware you're aware that the people on the stage are with you in the present. They are they, they, the, the, the story is literally unfolding synchronous with your own time. But also you're with a whole group of people and you're reacting to it and you will laugh. I mean, even if you're in the cinema and, you know, people will laugh at jokes and moments and whatever. And even if you're not, even if it's not funny at all, you will be, you will be led to laugh by the reaction of everyone around you because that is our biological nature. We, you know, it's, it's the mm -hmm. same reason why if someone is sitting and laughing in a room, you will almost probably start laughing as well, unless you're a psychopath. Mm. Yeah. But you're I, right. I think that's a very good point. The idea that the, that the music also serves as a as a kind of it's like Virgil. It, it's it's like it's like Virgil leading, uh, leading you through the inferno. You know, it, there's a there's a guide. There, there's a there's a there's a there's a hand with you. You know. Hmm. Well, as a, as a sign of how 
absolutely fascinating and transcendent I thought that conversation was. I'm going to give you a 13. Whoa! That round. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely dis- destroying my score system here. So, Unlucky for uh, some, but lucky for me. <laughs> lucky for you. Um, how about how about this choice then? Psychology, elite theory, or theology? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Uh, I, I am not sufficiently, I'm not sufficiently familiar with elite theory uh, in the way that my co-host is. So, uh, <laughs> theology. No, I'm also. I, I, I will choose psychology. Great. Would you like IQ tests are meaningless, social media is psychologically harmful, or power corrupts? Mm. Hmm. Dear, oh dear. These these are all difficult because there's it's it's difficult. Because I, I think that they're both true and false uh, in a way. Um, mm. I'm going to choose uh, social media is psychologically harmful. And will you be arguing for or against? I'm going to argue for with <laughs> with my usual caveats. caveats. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Well, again, like any power, like any tool, it can be used for your own benefit for the advancement of of your of your uh, you know your your civilization or it can be used to bash things apart you can build with a hammer or you can break with a hammer and so again i think that the advent of social media was an inevitable outcome of of electronic communication um, and i think that again this powerful tool can be used for good, but because of our fallen nature and, of course, the state of our civilizations, particularly Western civilization, but but pretty much all of them as well in modernity, I think that it, it, it is, unfortunately, uh, the majority of it is 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 is, is harmful. is used in is used in a harmful, damaging way. Hmm. Could you imagine? a more virtuous society in which social media was for for the benefit of everybody who used it that's a difficult question because i think that there are there are conditions inherent in social media that would even dissolve a more virtuous society that would even even mm. put so much stress upon it again i think that it's so many human systems i mean that there's a sort of balance created by our physical and and psychological and and instinctual nature that that helps to that helps to keep to to keep some sort of balance in interaction so i mean for instance everyone is together in a pub or you know a cafe or such and you're you're you know, you're interacting with people, you know, people that you know, and perhaps people that you don't know. They're, they're, and of course, operating in this scenario, there are the, the conventions of your particular culture that are, you know, the, these are things that, that, of course, that existed before you and that will exist after you. But these are sort of conventions that, that people have learnt and also that I think that are kind of inherent as well. I mean, I think many of these these things we call kind of what kind of manners and and and, and social conventions are actually sort of just um, they're in, they're they're enforced versions of instincts that we have towards group cohesion. You know, because I think animals, you know, even even lower animals, the, the, you know, they they have an instinctual drive to behave in a certain way because it because it, it ultimately is to their advantage as a group it, it keeps them it keeps them from harm it, it it allows them to you know to operate procure food and for the for, for the bearing of, of of offspring and all that so 
you know, but again, you're in a cafe or pub and, and that, you know, again, there's just, there's certain things that are enforced by convention, but also enforced by the constant threat of physical correction. In other words, mm. you're not going to go up to someone and say, you know, I hate you. You're a scumbag. You're ugly. Your, your wife is ugly. You, you, you know, you're, you're a pedophile. You, you can't just go up to someone and insult them in the, in the typical mm. way that happens, of course, all the time in social media without the fear of, of some consequence, you know, mm. that, that, that that person is going to punch you in the face, that there's going to be an altercation, there's going to be discomfort, there's going to be, you know, of course, social consequences of one sort or the other. And of course, now that we live in, you know, the modern West, and you know, you know, there's also the fear that, you know, you'll be arrested for, 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 for any of for any sort of slight or offense, you know, and certainly if you react yeah. to it, there's going to be there's going to be great consequence one way or the other. So these serve to kind of enforce behaviors that are beneficial to the maintenance of, of a society of civilization. Whereas, of course, I just think inherent in electronic communication. There is no. I mean, you, you again. You can. You, you. You. We are. We are all non-corporeal beings. You know. It's. I. I think. Believe Marshall McLuhan. You know. This. This idea that the moment you. The moment that you start to. Start to communicate, in in via an electronic form, you become. You become. Unmoored from your body. You become. You become a. You become a. A, a non-corporeal consciousness in a way. You know, you exist in a slightly different state, and 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 of course there are advantages to this. You know, it it allows, in some cases, it allows one to escape tyrannical control over certain unpopular, you know, opinions, uh, coin phrase. Uh, but <laughs> it also removes a lot of these ancient ways of enforcing beneficial behaviors you know in other words you you're now a, you're now a, a you're now a, a brain floating through the internet you know and so you can you can you can insult people you can behave in the most disgusting antisocial way possible which we all know and we all see every day and uh you know there will be no consequences for it and of course so so we all become this sort of free floating id uh with with no ego and super ego i'm sorry to to pick up the you know to pick up freud there but i i do think there is some validity to this to this model of the mind and so we're mm. just we're just these these ids you know where where the where the proto humans in the beginning of 2001 bashing each other over the head with bones um so and again i i just think that with even in a virtuous society i think that some of these problems would be mitigated if people were not so broken by modernity um but even even virtuous people uh, are easily led astray, you know, um, by by wow. by these qualities of, of social media. So I do think that that again, it's like the it's I I, I always make the Tolkien comparison, but I, I I can't resist it. It's so easy, you know. It's it's the, it's it's the, it's the One Ring. It it's it's it is it is so powerful. Now, of course, perhaps it's it's more apt that because of course the One Ring was altogether evil. Like it was not a neutral object. It was an evil object. And and part of the reason why it could not, it, it you know it was it was tempting. It caused people to behave in ways that they would not have behaved under normal circumstances. Like for instance, Boromir. I mean, Boromir had certain weaknesses that perhaps predisposed him to weak to be weak to the power of the ring. But but everyone, Frodo, Sam, Gandalf, they they all. They all were potentially led astray by this, and so there may be some aspect to to social media that, that is like the One Ring that that it it should mm. be cast into fire because it will eventually just corrupt everyone who everyone who touches it. That may be true. I don't I don't know. Hmm. There's there's another type of harm. So a lot of what you were describing is to do with the bad actors, as it were. Um, but an, another aspect of social media that I think can be very harmful is um, is, is the result of totally b 
benign, you know, people sharing their holiday photos and then other people scrolling through a great stream of their friends and family's lives being um, portrayed in a, in, in a slightly incorrect way. Well, I, I, I say it's benign. I, I guess I should maybe look deeper and, and ask, is it, is it good to be <laughs> posting photos of your holiday onto Instagram or Facebook or whatever? Like, why, what was the drive? What was your original intention? But, uh, you know, assuming that people simply want to sort of share the joy of their life, you know, something nice has happened to me. <laughs> people I love will be made happy uh, by seeing this you know they post the thing and then i don't think course, so luke i i think i think it's <laughs> i think it's called vanity <laughs> vanity of vanity is all I'm, all is vanity. Yes, I, I am being overly generous here charitable yeah some, you know there's something about the well i guess this can happen without social media right you could you could say you go to church and your friend comes over and tells you how their life is going and they they talk about all the wonderful things that have been going on and you leave thinking oh wow their life is really going great compared to mine this makes me sad so you know there's nothing new under the sun i guess um but social media certainly appears to have accelerated the negative parts of society yeah. more than the positive parts of society and all, all of these traits of course have been around with us forever you know as, as i said mm -hmm. i mean we you know, if you think about, you know, uh, like, you know, if you were in the 18th century, it, it was much harder. Of course, if you're if you're upper class type, um, you, you know, you could commission Thomas Gainsborough to, you know, to paint your portrait with your with your right pursed lip wife sitting in your best clothes in you know in a yeah. in a vista of your property and and of course what yeah. and and then you would hang it in your house where people could see it and and so it would re mm. but would to you it would reinforce your idea of yourself your own status but it would also reinforce your status to to people who saw it and and of course that was purely performative there was no mm. that, that, that they were they were not having Gainsborough or you know Anthony van Dyke or any of these other wonderful portraits they weren't having him do it to share the joy of, of, of the joy of their <laughs> of their existence with their family no 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 and 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 so now but now it's just easy anyone can do it you know you know um yeah. you know bad bads and you know you know bads and <laughs> and uh you know, you know and his 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 his, his, his orange Some wife can, yeah <laughs> should share their photos of of of, of their piss up in ibiza and and Therese. you know yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so I do think that, of course, that there is something about there is something about electronic communication, social media, all of these things that um, that just exacerbate these ancient these ancient vices, these ancient, you know, uh, you know. No. But it's, it's ancient... in, it is always in our power to um, master ourselves. And respond to these antagonistic forces in a positive way. You could argue that the conceit for this very this very game show, The Gauntlet, is f fundamentally antagonistic to good society. Yes. And yet, we will take it in in the spirit in which it is meant, which is merely a bit of fun. Mm -hmm. And I'm giving you a nine, a nine for that round. Mm. Fine. Well, I, consider... I, I will say, I will say that, that you have always had. An ambiguously chaotic energy, Luke. So, so, uh, so the the the, the, uh, the, the you're not the, wrong. Yes, the, the chaotic, the, cha the chaotic and perhaps belligerent aspect of mm. you know, and of course, I, I I've always said, and I think it's it's certainly fundamental truth is that is that there is a there is a comp there is a component to masculine interaction when men when two men or more interact with each other that is always combative. There is always an element mm -hmm. that's exact. There's an always an inherent challenge, even amongst friends. So I accept yeah. that as as human nature <laughs> to celebrate well, it. Well, the thing the thing that's not masculine here is that I think a, a true the the thing that appeals to men is 
a genuine unbiased test of skill or strength you know we we don't want to have a game where everybody wins or where it could be massaged Absolutely if we're going to run we want to know who's the fastest if we're going to arm wrestle we want to we want to know who's actually the the strongest and in this game i'm just arbitrarily coming up with scores so there's something a little feminine about that that i can you know i can massage the numbers if i choose well so uh, you know in a the, the masculine side of me would want to put the scores up to a vote or something that you know is outside of my control but the uh elite part of me detests democracy and yeah we <laughs> don't like uses that so, uh, round round five. There are two Ooh. rounds to go. I'm sorry that we're running slow, but it's just because I'm enjoying it too much. Um, uh, I, I'm af I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you've you. Got quite to go. Soon. Yeah. Well, let's make the last two rounds speed rounds then, and you only have like, let's say, a minute or two to answer, and then I can give you okay. a score. How does that sound? All right. So, what do we? Technology, we natural sciences, or Christology? Ooh. Christology. No. Yeah. The nature Ooh. of Jesus. Yeah. It's a um, theological topic. Difficult. I'll take natural sciences. The risks of genetic engineering outweigh its benefits. There has been no progress in physics for decades. Or antimicrobial resistance as a ticking time bomb. Hmm. Well, I shall take number number one. Go ahead. What was number one again? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> the risks of genetic engineering outweigh its benefits. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think this is very easy, and of course, I agree with that statement wholeheartedly. Um. Um. Again, it it is it is it, you you have meddled in the primal forces of nature, Mister Beale, and you must atone. I mean, I think that again, like so many other aspects of of human, certainly the human body and its function, we really have no idea about. I mean, we 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 know we we have learned a lot, certainly in the past hundred years or so, about human genetics and 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 and, and how it affects biology and all those things but we are so ignorant of the kind of even the kind of biological consequences of meddling with, with these things you know it's just, it's just like if you have no idea about electrics and you decide to you know to you know to try to defuse a bomb you know well maybe you you know cutting the red wire I mean, you may have some rudimentary idea of what you're doing but of course you have no guarantee that you're not going to it's not going to blow up in your face and so I, I just think any time we and of course if you you can look back in the history of medicine to where people have meddled in things you know I mean back when you know well I had to deal with severe psychological distress we will sever <laughs> we will sever uh, one part of the brain from another we will we'll literally go in and cut it called the leucotomy or like lobotomy and of course an utter disaster I mean it, it's it sort of worked and it, it turned people into you know pliant pliant uh pliant pliant zombies but uh but again you, you, you we have no idea so for purely from that aspect i think that it should be forbidden but also again it is giving people the one ring and telling them to to use it to make i will use it to, to do good yes well you won't because again the the, the, the savage tendencies of humans will always use those sort of powers in the in the worst way possible and just imagine i mean look at the state of what we call an elite whether you know even just the financial elite people people look, look at the state of most people who are, who are who are who are wealthy the people who would be able to make use of these technologies look at the people who rule over the west uh and and look at what they want out of humanity and and just say do you mm. want to give these people this power now again i don't know how you can stop it i think a, like a lot of these things it, it it's it's like you know atomic weapons you know it's just like once once that pandora's jar was open 
there was no mm. pushing all this there was no pushing all the horrors back into it so i'm afraid yes that these that this is going to continue and that there is no way to stop it but uh I, I I think it is absolutely horrible, and I wish I wish it could be forever. I, I again I, I because because again I don't you know people will say well you know we could we could we could we could cure disease we could remove weakness from the world well but but that isn't our province you know we we don't have the wisdom or the all the all the goodness to make those decisions and of I, course I have very it's only going to be a interesting conversation with the GP recently who was arguing that most of the uh, improvements in uh the risks around pregnancy and uh, well and giving birth in particular were nothing to do with quote unquote medicine it, it wasn't we have all these new surgeries and drugs and blah 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 it's just people eat more you know nutritious food yeah. and have children at a more sensible age <laughs> that's basically accounts for 95 percent of the improvement in um you know the mortality of mothers when they give birth oh yeah also, um, i mean you, you, you know people can can cannot even imagine how how the vast improvement in in general nutrition uh, changed uh, change changed the world you know all all you have yeah. to do is just look at look back at old, old photographs of, of, of even people in the 1910s, 1920s, and you will see that in general they're much smaller, um, that they're, they're, they're much yeah. less um, less thriving. Now, of course, we we've, we've gone too far in the opposite direction. Is, you know, we've got too people, yes. too many people who 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 good, have too much news. Nutrition. As of yes, as of this year, there are more people dying of um, o being overweight than underweight worldwide. I believe, yeah. which is a real milestone. Yeah, I mean, is, is that an improvement? I don't, I don't know. Well, and, and the reason I brought it up is because I, it real really shines a light on the so-called, you know, benefits of medicine in general. Well, medicine's got lots of genuinely good things going on, but the way that it is perceived, and I think, again, partly due to propaganda, sort of progressive, you know, the Victorian age was unfathomably terrible and we've come so far since then it's actually you know th things have not you know th modern technology has not made as sweeping improvements as you maybe think it has i'm going to give you a nine for that i think pre you know pr pretty cleanly uh and convincingly argued and on to the final round literature software and mathematics or eschatology I'm here, right here. Um, literature, lit software, and mathematics, or eschatology. You want literature? Well, it's certainly not going to be number two. Literature. <laughs> okay, here are your three final assertions to choose from. Censorship of literature is dangerous. Poetry is the most potent form of literature. Or children's literature is as complex and significant as adult literature. I'm going to choose uh, number two. And are you arguing for or against? Uh, hmm. Poetry is the most potent form of literature. I, I'm going to. I'm going to argue. I'm going to argue for that. You know. Hmm. So I. I. I, I have if people. I, I've talked about this very various times. People who who follow me. Uh, may know this but i i have never really enjoyed reading fiction um hmm. with some exceptions obviously obviously it, you know i i mean prose fiction right? so so yes. obviously you know um th there are some exceptions obviously tolkien and uh, yeah. you know other there's a few other marcel proust and and uh, a few few uh, sort of hard sci-fi people uh you know, short stories mostly, uh, but I, I don't like the novel for the most part. Uh, and I've always been drawn to to poetry, and, and I think that one of the, the reasons that, that poetry is so powerful is that I think it's it's very much analogous to painting. You know, in in a sense that mm. you're you, you're providing you you are you are you are making material. 
your own sensory and emotional and philosophical ideas of 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 of, of, of sensory existence you know uh and and of course painting does this by by using materials using using pigments using their particular physical properties using their kind of placement um, if you're talking about painting uh i mean any any art does this um but but it but it does it through almost a kind of winnowing out of all of the of all of the, the of everything except the most the most powerful the kind of distillation of of the important aspects of whatever you're trying to paint if you're doing something representational or even more importantly i think that there is a, is a sort of analogy between po poetry and abstract uh, or you know quote non-objective painting um that um again it, it, it's very strong i mean you're sort of picking out these colors from a box and you're you're, you're making your own combinations whatever and you're combining them in a way that is maximally affecting because you've only got so much space you've only got so many colors you know uh mm -hmm. in order to in order to make this work and the same with poetry you know you, you are choosing you're you're not you're not giving a narrative as as much as you're choosing like a, like a jeweler you're picking gems out of a box and you're setting the gems you know through a laborious process you're setting them in in, in an arrangement that is going to have the maximum effect on the person who you know who looks upon it or wears it and so so i do think that there is some sort of some 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 something to that you know mm. um and also it's it's so much more tied to a kind of again sort of pointing up the abstract qualities uh of of language you know because so much of poetry is it's not just about conveying meaning but it's about conveying you know, it's it's like we talked about in cinema. You know, the, how powerful it is by putting one image next to another in time, mm. that you can convey so much with just a simple cut, uh, and very mm. much like that with poetry. You you are giving sounds, you are giving words that are loaded with connotations and with 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 meaning and with meter. You know, um, and in a way, you're sort of you're sort of not only telling a story, but you're creating you're creating uh, a kind of feeling in the reader or in the person or or even more powerfully recited oop, oop. Uh, so so I do think there's an analogy there and there's a reason why I, I've always liked poetry more than um, more than prose uh, it, it struck me recently that there's something that happens inside you in a way that if you read a poem a hundred times you develop a relationship with it um i think the same way about uh, about paintings looking at one painting for 10 minutes is a very different experience than looking at 10 you know equally amazing paintings in 10 minutes but with a minute for each one it's it's about the the story that that piece of artwork has had with you and the the multiple thoughts that you have had about that one that one thing so it, it yeah it's and i think same thing i probably first really recognized this quality with bible verses that especially the same bible verse in the same translation thinking about it, reading it enough, memorizing it, it takes on a whole new quality where it becomes, it actually becomes a part of you in its very specific form. Um, that it just, it generates a whole raft of uh, reactions that it's impossible to reach in a single pass. You, you know, you, you, it is necessary with certain art to experience it repeatedly. And it's only by that kind of digging that you get to the real heart and core of what it is. And it's the brevity of a poem 
um, or the the fact that a single image is is not moving, not animated, that that almost generates the profundity. In indeed, you know, and I was you know just just very briefly reminded of uh, you know a poem that I I I did uh, a couple of streams on with Panama Hat, which is P.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which is you know modernist poetry, but very different in, in nature from. You know, you know, from from more more kind of explicitly me metrical poems um, of the past, but you know, again, just just considering the first few lines of the wasteland, April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. You know, and again, it, it's just, mm. I mean, particularly, you know, it's this this declarative state. Uh, and 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 a sort of shocking personification of of a month, and 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 the sort of presentation of the idea of spring, as as in this context, not necessarily a sort of joyful awakening, but being pulled out of a slumber. Um, so anyway, it's it's wonderful, and and it can be so powerful, as you said. Uh, but I, a lot of commotion is going on here, so I'm afraid I'm going to let's, have to go and let's, end it. Let's bring this to an end. So I'm giving you ten for that. And this is the high score table. So if I refresh, you are at the top of the high score table. You have the highest score of any of my guests so far at 61. Uh, and thank you very much for joining me. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs>